Good morning, everyone. I um, wasn't sure about the composition of the audience today. So I will speak with you about uh, homelessness and illness and dying. But I wanted to start by giving you an overview of some of the things that I learned about loneliness from my readings and from my research. This is a picture that I took last December in San Diego, the United States. Uh, I don't know if it's clear enough. It's a guy taking a selfie of him and the ocean. And when I saw that, I said, wow, that's loneliness. There's nobody else beside him. Nobody is ready to take a picture of him. He is just there with the ocean. I started my research on loneliness in 1980. And since then, I've spoken with people about loneliness. And afterwards, people come and tell me, you know, when, when I heard that you were going to talk to us about loneliness, I thought to myself, oh, that's terrific. I have struggled with it sometimes. And now uh, I'll hear all the information, and I'll find all the answers. And then I can get rid of my loneliness and move on. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. The way life is, is that you have a whole pile of problems here. And as soon as you finish with them, there is a new pile. Uh, are you familiar with Dean Ornish? Dean Ornish is a cardiologist who is a groundbreaker. Up to the 1980s, if one had um, heart problems, and, and especially build up of plaque and that kind of stuff, what we knew is that maybe we can stop it, but there is no way to reverse it. Well, he has done a lot of studies, which initially people laughed at him. And he showed that you can not only arrest the disease, but you can reverse it. So this is a guy who really knows what he's talking about. And then in 1998, he publishes a book on love and survival. And when I heard about it, I said, what the heck does a cardiologist have to do with love? But that's exactly the point, that he believed that just physicality is not the important thing. What's important is love, which he came to um, associate with being together, with harmony. And he said, and if I may, I want to read to you, our survival depends on the healing power of love intimacy and relationships, physically, emotionally, spiritually, as individuals, as communities, as a culture, perhaps even as a species. So when we talk about loneliness, this is what we really want, all of us, belonging and love. The problem is, that while some of the people are lonely some of the time, too many of them are lonely too much of the time. And I'm not going to ask for hands to be raised as to who feels or felt lonely. But in my talks, I often ask, is there anyone here who has never felt lonely? Nobody raises their hand. And I'm saying, OK. I expected it, and I know that all of us, at some point or another, experience loneliness. And maybe a lot of what I will talk with you today is going to be known to you. I will just kind of put it together in a way that hopefully makes sense. There are two <coughs> major approaches. I see by your eyes that you're starting to read while I talk. So I'm not going to show it to you. I want to say something, and then I'll let you read. There's two major approaches to loneliness. One that says that our society, the way it's built now in the last 50 years, really enhances loneliness. Uh, if you think about um, filling up your car with gas, you don't need to talk to anybody. You put in the, the visa, and bingo, it goes. Most of the buildings, at least in Toronto, 
have very long and narrow corridors. And if you dare to stop and talk to a neighbor, you disturb the other people. So everything is done so we keep on moving. We don't need to get into a bank anymore. We have a card. Uh, most university hallways, especially those that were built up to about 20 years ago, are built the same way. Long and not very wide corridors. And we want movement. <clears throat> so this approach says that basically our society enhances loneliness. And in the past, people were less lonely. I subscribe to the other approach, the experiential one, which was, um, for, uh, which was uh, talked about by Clark Moustakas, who in 61 wrote an amazing seminal book called Loneliness. And he really, that book really sucked me into the topic. And he says that loneliness is our ability to be alive. We know how to laugh and we can feel sorrow and we can feel happiness and we can feel desires and in the same way we can feel loneliness. So loneliness is part of being human. One of the uh, researchers <clears throat> on loneliness wrote down that the breakdown of the nuclear family, the reduced involvement on the part of the several fathers in reconstituted families, the rising divorce statistics, and the increasing mobility of modern society all contributed to increase loneliness until it reached epidemic proportion. And that is suggesting that our society is becoming so fragmented that loneliness is experienced now more than ever before. That's the social approach to loneliness. I added one uh, little thing to what Clark Mustakas and others said. And I suggested that loneliness is in us as almost a recessive gene. And it is experienced when the conditions are right. And those conditions can vary, either from my, our childhood, our present, societal forces, etc., etc. But it's there, the potential for loneliness is there all the time. Is it okay if, if I suggest that people may ask questions or make comments? Not too difficult questions, but questions uh, during the presentation, Mary Pat? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay. If there's anything that you wish to share, terrific. Okay. When we speak about loneliness, we really are talking about an umbrella term that covers many various feelings, behaviors, thoughts, and experiences. I see loneliness in, in uh, accordance with uh, Clark Mustakas, not as a feeling, but as an experience. And when I looked at the literature on loneliness, I found out that it is really different, but there are three main characteristics that unite them all. First of all, uh, it is a, uh, a universal phenomenon that all human beings and animals feel. Uh, I'm saying animals, and uh, we really can't speak with animals. But watching their behaviors, we know that they feel it. And, um, we watch it in that they want to be in hurts. They want to run with everyone else. But we also see what happens when one of them lags behind. The lion gets dinner. And if you look at loneliness in an evolutionary term, uh, then that's what happens to us. We 
are social animals. We cannot survive without other people. And loneliness is simply an internal alarm bell that says, hey, something is not right. Just like when we feel thirsty or hungry, something is not right. Do something about it in order to stop the pain. The second thing is that uh, it's a subjective experience influenced by personal, familial, childhood, societal, and desires that we may have. And I don't know if people talked about it before. We may get a little bit into it now. Are you familiar with attachment theory um, that, that, that was advanced by one of your countrymen, I believe, uh, Bowlby? Um, and, and the way we're treated in childhood can have long term effects on who we are, including on the way and the frequency that we experience loneliness. <sighs> loneliness, and when I, talk, when, when I speak a bit about my research, I will come back to it, that um, loneliness is not one thing. It, it, it has all kinds of manifestations, but one thing is is experienced by anyone who experiences loneliness, and that's a lot of pain. It's distressing, it's unpleasant, it's painful, with the goal of moving us to do something about it. We talked about harmony, our wish to belong, and loneliness. And I have a short story I want to read to you that I don't know where it belongs, whether in belonging and love or competition and loneliness. Is there anyone here of a Greek or Italian heritage? Good. Good. <laughs> Uh, a Greek and an Italian were sitting in a Starbucks one day discussing who had the superior culture. Over triple lattes, the Greek guy says, well, we have the Parthenon. Arching his eyebrows, the Italian replies, we have the Colosseum, i.e. we're better. The Greek uh, retorts, we Greeks gave birth to, the, to advanced mathematics true. The Italian, nodding in agreement, says, but we built the Roman Empire. And so on, until the Greek comes up with what he thinks will end the discussion. And he says with a flourish of finality, the Greek, we invented sex. The Italian replied, that's true, but it was the Italians who introduced it to women. <laughs> I'll talk in a while about um, the stigma that is related to loneliness. <clears throat> I want to read to you what Susan Schultz said 40 years ago, 42 years ago, and it's still 40, applies today. She said, to be alone is to be different. To be different is to be alone. And to be in the interior of this fatal circle is to be lonely. And to be lonely is to have failed. And our culture admires and adores success. And if you are a failure, I don't want to connect with you because other people will think I'm a failure too. And so, um, <clears throat> as a psychologist, as, as a teacher in university, I speak with people about all sorts of problems. And many times in my classes, um, we sign 
an agreement that nothing uh, personal will come out of the class. So people feel more comfortable to talk. And they will talk about almost anything except loneliness. And that illustrates how strong that uh, stigma is. <clears throat> One of the reasons that I, I was delighted to have been invited to speak here is that I personally, and I think that this series is doing it as well, um, I, I feel that I'm on a mission to get loneliness out of the closet. So we as a society become aware of it and uh, talk about it and do something about it. This guy is not happy. <clears throat> the stigma of loneliness in our couple culture. We're becoming a bit more open in general, but still. If you are alone, it's a bit uncomfortable. And sometimes, um, and people know that once they get separated or divorced, it's difficult to know who is your friend, who is your <coughs> ex-partner's friend, um, if you go out with another couple and, and, and you're a man, the other man may think, wow, that's dangerous, he's free. He could try and, and go after my wife. It's, it's uncomfortable. Our society is a couple culture. In the 1980s, I was asked by a community college in Toronto to have a full day seminar on, on a Saturday about loneliness. I said, terrific, there's a lot to talk about. So we, we published in the calendar, Ami will give a seminar on loneliness, come. <clears throat> and two days before the seminar was about to go, I got a call from my boss, the director of continuing education, and he said, sorry, only two people registered. And we had about 25, 30 spots. I said, okay, <clears throat> then it's not going. And he said, no, come and talk to me during the week. I came and I spoke with him during the week and he said, no, I want you to talk about it. But we have to find a way of not frightening people. So I thought about it and the next semester came out um, a description in the calendar that says, Ami Rokach, who is a psychologist, will teach people who treat people, how to help those who are lonely. It was packed. Nobody was ready to come to a seminar and identify himself as lonely. But if it was under the guise of, I'll teach you how to help them, because you're not lonely, everybody else is. Then they had no problems coming. Uh, <clears throat> loneliness anxiety. This is a term that was coined by Clark Mustakas. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, you had a chance to see or associate with people who came, uh, who, were, who were in concentration camps in the Second World War. Coming from Israel, I did. And those people were traumatized, not only because of what they went through, but a lot of it was because of hunger. So now they are living in Israel, they have a lot of food, but uh, the kitchen is full of condiments and food, and some people had food under their mattress, under the bed, and it was rotting, and they still had it. And when we started, we psychologists, psychiatrists, started to try and understand what's going on, we understood that they are anxious about, not about um, starving. They knew cognitively that they're not gonna starve. They were anxious about the fear that will come if they start to starve. So just hoarding food calmed them down. Loneliness anxiety is very similar. It is because we said before that loneliness is very painful, there are some people who are very afraid of that pain and they will do anything and everything 
to avoid the fear, anxiety that comes if they perceive that they're going to become lonely. And I had an interesting experience uh, when I taught in a community college, another one, in Toronto uh, in the 1981-82. And I had a friend who was uh, a teacher there as well. We, we would teach in the evening from 7 to 10 in the evening. And before that, we would meet at about 6, 6.15 to sit in the cafeteria and shoot the breeze and have a cup of coffee. And one day, I see a friend of hers walking in, whom I have seen before in, in one of our gatherings, and uh, she was a bank executive, always dressed to, to the hilt, uh, very bright, with an excellent sense of humor. And my friend said to me, well, you know, she may be a bit different because she just got separated from a five-year-old uh, romantic engagement. And she came in, and we're sitting, and we're talking, we're laughing. And then I say to her, I realize that you are after a separation. Are, are you lonely? And she said, me? I'm never lonely. I said, OK, terrific. It didn't make sense, but I said, terrific. Then later on, as we're joking, I say to her, hey, what do you think about a cup of coffee, you and me? And she says, Excellent. Let me see when. And that was in November of that year. <clears throat> she looks and looks and looks and says, what about the 10th of March? And I say, hey, kiddo, all I want is a cup of coffee. <laughs> and she says, you don't understand. I am so busy. I date every night, sometimes two guys, one after the other. <laughs> And I said to myself, and that's after she told me she's not lonely. I said to myself, that's an excellent example of loneliness anxiety. She is simply running all the time, so she doesn't have time to even feel. Solitude. Um, just quickly, to separate it from loneliness. Uh, when, when I say to people, what do you think about when you think about loneliness? They'll say, being alone. And, and being alone geographically or physically could lead to loneliness. But an even more difficult experience is loneliness that you may experience when you are with other people. Uh, and if you want to try it, go on a busy bus or on the underground uh, on a busy morning. And you see people, you touch them, and you don't know them. And, and Walk in university, and you'll have the same feeling. But the worst loneliness, in my opinion, is loneliness in a romantic relationship. And maybe, maybe, I will be able to come back in the future and talk about it, um, about what loneliness can do to a romantic togetherness. But that is the most painful loneliness uh, situation, a relationship which is supposed to be the answer to loneliness, can produce loneliness, and can be destroyed by it. Solitude is being by myself to do what I want and can do only by myself. So while loneliness happens to us not because we want to, solitude happens because we chose to be alone and to do things that we can do only alone, like think, reflect, write, uh, walk in nature, etc., etc. It's a very refreshing, nourishing, replenishing time. All, all, uh, maybe not all, but most of the great literary works were done when the writer was sitting alone. Uh, I know some people who who need to be creative when they write a thesis, or they decide that they want to write a book. They put themselves for a month in a room or in a hotel, and they let the creative juices run. OK. <clears throat> I started uh, in 1980 to read about loneliness and found out then, today it's different, found out then that there was really not that much written about it. 
And I always believed that if I can't find something, I will create it. And that's what I did. As a psychologist, it was very tempting to do what others have done. <clears throat> For instance, there is the UCLA Loneliness Questionnaire, which basically gives you 20 items. And when you answer it, it tells you two things. One, whether you're lonely or not, as if you didn't know it. And two, how deeply lonely you feel. Well, that's what psychologists do. I, I, I didn't like it, and I thought that it's too unidimensional. So what I did, I went about it the hard way, which is probably one of my characteristics. I took 660 people everywhere I could get them. I would ask the evening students uh, at the college who were representative of the uh, general population more than the youngsters in university in the mornings. I used to go to parks and where people went to eat and, and rest a bit, I would harass them and I would ask them to write and, and amass uh, a body of 660 pages and I gave them a white page, and it had only two lines. Please tell me what is loneliness for you, and tell me how do you successfully cope with it. So it's very easy to construct it. It's extremely difficult to make sense of it. So what I wanted to find out are what are the qualities, what are the shades, what, are, what is the taste, the different tastes of loneliness. I already then, and research now um, seems to confirm it, that I already then didn't think that loneliness is just loneliness, period. I think that there's much more to it. And apparently, when after three years with three research assistants, I was able to make some sense of the 660 pages. Um, I created a model which had five factors of what is really loneliness. And just to begin with, I'll say that as loneliness or when you're lonely, it doesn't mean that you will feel or go through the five factors, but at least two of them you will experience. The first one is emotional distress, and I think that probably everyone, as we said before, who goes through loneliness experiences them, and that is the great pain, the emotional uh, chaos, storm, the yearning that we go through when we feel loneliness. And if there is one that seems to, to go through all the loneliness experiences, it's probably this one. Uh, feeling not included, maybe even ignored. And, and I'm reading to you some comments from the questionnaire that later on I created. And all people need to do is just mark down uh, what applies to them. And it says, I felt I was boring and uninteresting. In other words, nobody would want to interact with me. I felt inadequate when I interacted with other people. Or I just felt ignored. So that's a second uh, dimension of loneliness. Interpersonal isolation is probably what most of us would say when asked what is loneliness. Um, if I, I felt I had no one to love or be loved one, there was no romantic relationship. Uh, I did not matter to those closest to me. He talks about love, but not only romantic love. These are only sample items. He talks about the love and the closeness with the community, with the family, which is missing for the person. Self-alienation. This is an interesting one. I felt as if my mind and body were in different places. I felt as if I didn't know myself. I felt as if I was observing myself from the outside. When I collected the 660 pages and started to analyze them, I saw those descriptions and, and many more. And I said, it must be a mistake because 
people are describing things that I would expect people who had schizophrenia to, to say. When I got more and more of them, I had to explain how come I'm getting what, what on the face of it seems crazy. Well, apparently, it's very adaptable. When we experience extreme pain, what happens? There was a question. <laughs> we faint. We dissociate from the pain because we can't take it. When loneliness gets such that we can't take the pain, we dissociate from who we are. We kind of observe it from the outside. So we know we're lonely. We know that the pain is excruciating, but we don't have to feel the terrible feelings. The last dimension is a, an exciting one. Clark Mustakas. Really, if anyone has the time and the inclination, I highly recommend that you read his book. It's a thin book, mesmerizing. He talked about growth that can be part of loneliness. And when I read it, I said, oh yeah, right. <laughs> You're at the bottom of the barrel. You experience so much pain and rejection. What is he talking about? And then I asked people, what is loneliness? And I had a sizable number, not all of them, obviously, who said, yes, yes, that's, that's what happens. When I am down there, being sure that nobody wants me, that nobody likes me, that do, nobody really appreciates me, I realize who I am. Because I'm the only one who has to get myself up out of the pit. And people talked about growing spiritually. Uh, they talked about <coughs> personal growth. They talked about gaining new appreciation of friends and gaining new appreciation of their resources. When you are down there and you are alone and you have to get yourself out of there by yourself, when you do that, you know that you can do some, some things in life. You're not just dependent on others. I asked, who is the lonely? How does he look? How does he sound? How do I know when one is lonely when I meet him or her? Here's what the literature says, and, and my research as well seems to corroborate it. Uh, these people feel unwanted and unloved and rejected. Most of the time, they're sad and depressed, and I'll say a word about depression in a minute. Uh, they perceive themselves as unattractive, uninteresting. Remember one of my, uh, model, one of my uh, dimensions talked about I'm boring and I'm uninteresting. I'm watching my my time. Uh, but thank you for helping me. <laughs> they feel desperate and hopeless. I'll come to that hopeless in a minute. And vulnerable. And sometimes, as I said before, most of the people who are lonely will not talk about it because it's not socially acceptable or condoned. But when the pain becomes too much, they will suddenly start to express their pain and sometimes even aggressively. And unfortunately, when, when a person goes and looks for a partner and starts to talk a lot about all those feelings too early, what happens to people is they run away. But that again is an evolutionary mechanism to make sure that when the pain gets too much, we need to do something about it, we start to express it, even when it's inappropriate. That's what animals do as well. Okay, I wanna talk a bit about the homeless and about the ill and about the dying, and then I wanna share with you um, <clears throat> my approach to treating people who are lonely. Uh, I'll read to you 
what Sonia, a homeless woman, uh, wrote for Hill, who published a book in 2001. She said, no one really cares if I die today or tomorrow because they're so consumed with making money, with having power and control. And even if I die today, people just won't care. But one thing is for sure. Sitting here all alone, cold and desperate to find a little bit of meaning in my life, I realize, and that's so sad, that there really isn't any. And if in the past we became aware of the homeless um, through movies, books, TV programs, now we see them on, on the streets. And in big cities, in major cities, they're all over the place. You will see them if you open your eyes. Many times we prefer not to see them. There's a really uncomfortable feeling about seeing people who are so much down. And even if we give them something, it's not going to help. Not much. Who are they? In general, some statistics. About half of them are unemployed. F half of them receive social assistance. A third of them are alcoholics or drug abusers. Uh, and, uh, alcoholics and 15 are drug abusers. 20% of them, and maybe higher, are ex-psychiatric patients which we feel so proud as a, as a community to say, now we get them out of the hospital as fast as, as possible. That's really good for them. But many of them, and war vets as well, end up on the street. And that's as horrible as being in a psychiatric hospital. 9% have been evicted and 3% have physical disabilities. When my son, who is now 33, uh, went through high school, when it was 15 years ago, 17 years ago, he needed to do something good for the community. I think that's an excellent uh, requirement of kids. And we volunteered to feed the homeless. So we would go at 3 in the morning to a Salvation Army Center. We would prepare breakfast and sandwiches and coffee and porridge. And we would put it all on the truck. And you know those trucks that, that sell ice cream? They have a large window through which you can feed the people. And we would go around the streets of Toronto at 4 in the morning in places I never even dreamed are possible under, under uh, bridges and, and really places that I would never want to go by myself. And we would feed the homeless. And one, one morning, we were sitting by the major library in Toronto on, on a relatively good, in a relatively good neighborhood. And some people were coming to have a coffee, to have some porridge. We would give them underwear and socks. And a guy comes, and he is dressed with a white shirt and a tie and a jacket. And he says hello to the guy who was our boss there. And he got breakfast and coffee, and he left. And then I said to the guy, wow, he really, you, you made his day. And he's going to work, and he didn't have time to have coffee at home. He stopped by, and he had coffee with you. He said, no. He's a divorced guy who was cleaned out by his wife. He has nowhere to sleep. He works full time. But he's homeless. And he's dressed like that because he has to go to work in the bank. Whoa. That shocked me. So there are some homeless that we don't even realize or recognize that they're homeless. Uh, a guy by the name of Rosenthal, who did a lot of uh, research on homeless, divided them into three groups. He said the first one are slackers. Those are the uh, people that, due to their laziness, irresponsibility, or drug abuse, simply don't work, don't have money, and they're homeless. 
And a lot of people, unfortunately, when you talk about the homeless, think about that and say, well, let them go to work. The second ones are the lackers, those who lack competency due to uh, physical illness, due to um, disadvantaged upbringing. They simply can't fit into the working world. And the third group are the unwilling witness, wi uh, victims, just like that bank worker that I didn't realize was a homeless. These are competent members of society who were caught up by circumstances beyond their control and became homeless. Uh, the literature on the homeless suggests that in contrast to what some people think about them, the slackers, they're lazy, they don't want to work, really, really have a very difficult life. It's very tough to survive on the street. Not only that you can be cold, and in Toronto, it once happened that we were driving with the truck on February, uh, it was minus 20, which in, in Alberta, that's the middle of the summer, right? Uh, <laughs> And there was a guy sleeping on the grate, the heating grate. And we touched him to give him food, and he didn't move. And we had to call the police. He simply froze to death. Uh, there's violence that's happening on the street. People lose their shoes because somebody stronger came to take it away from them. But the worst is, I read some of their descriptions. I'm sitting outside. People come and go from the restaurant or from the supermarket and I look at them begging with my eyes for something to help me and they don't see me. So when we talk about loneliness, that's almost the epitome of loneliness. I'm not part of my family. I'm not part of my society. I don't even know where do I belong. All I know is that I'm no good. I'm no good because I'm here on the street. And every day I have to fight for my survival. When I did my, my research on them, I was lucky enough to get a large group through my connection with the Salvation Army of the homeless, gave them the questionnaire, spoke with them, and there are two, when I compared them to the general population, they differed on mainly two of the dimensions. One is Clearly, we would expect interpersonal isolation. I'm alone, nobody wants me, I'm no good. The second one I didn't expect, and that was self-alienation. It is so bad being so unwanted, having no place to put your head on at night, that they distance themselves from the whole situation through self-alienation that help them not, not know what's going on, but at least not feel the incredible pain that is, a, that, that is related to that. One of the worst places to go when you're ill is into a hospital. It is a big, efficient machine that just wants to get people in and out. And um, it's very easy to feel lonely in a hospital. Here you are, you're ill, you're in pain, you may need surgery, which is very frightening by itself, but you're in a place which says to you, we're gonna treat you very similar, not identical, but very similar to a jail. First of all, give us your clothes. Then we're gonna put on you something that shows all of your behind, because you have to wear it that way. And then we're going to send nurses to check you. They're not going to do it in a nice kind of sexy way. They are coming, they're checking you, they move out to the next guy. Food will feed you, but you will probably choose not to eat it because it's going to be so horrible. And then you're going to get injections and you're going to get tests and you're going to get all kinds of exams. And, and all the time the illness is bothering you. 
and people come to visit you. But the difference between you and them is that they come and they leave. You stay there and you're alone. And your family may be there with you, but no one can really feel and experience what you do with the anxiety, with the concerns about the future, and with the fact that when the physician comes in, I don't know if you had that experience, but when the physician comes in, he doesn't talk to you. He talks to the other physicians or to the residents. I was hospitalized for three, four days uh, a year and a half ago. And by the draw of the luck, the luck of the draw, I was placed in a room which was right across from the nurse's station. So I said to myself, okay, that's terrific. They'll kind of watch over us. Well, what happened was that the whole night I couldn't sleep because they were talking, they were having fun. And when I went to say, you know, I need to sleep, could you? They said, well, we're working. So they have to talk very loudly when they're working. To my left, the, it, it was a semi-private room, was a guy who I later on found out uh, had his um, workers come late at night and he would give them instructions as to whom to sell the drugs and how much to charge. So <laughs> I was there, I was in a bit of pain, I was a bit concerned. On my left was a drug dealer, on my right were the nurses, and I can't sleep. Uh, two, days, two days later, the physician um, came to give him medications. He said, I don't want any of your medication. The physician said, look, you're going to kill yourself. And he said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of you. I'm leaving. And I was sure that the physician will say it was the, cardio the cardiac ward. No, you can't do that. You'll kill yourself. He said, okay, that's what you want. So he left with his best friend who helped him sell drugs. But he was so angry that he said to his friend, and I had to hear all that. He said, I'm going to take everything from here with me. I've never seen that before. He took the sheets and he took the pillows and he took everything and he left. And I don't know if they saw him, but nobody was ready to stop him because he was probably dangerous. That's a small example of how alienating and lonely that experience of being sick is when really what we need is exactly the opposite. Something that could hold us, something that could support us, not just physically. Dying. Um, I, became, I became aware of dying when I um, assisted my father 14 years ago when he was in the hospice, suffering from uh, uh, cancer to go. He was there for the last 10 days. And uh, up to that point, I, I had the approach toward death. Well, it just happens to other people. So there's no need for me to deal with that. But that place really got me aware of what it's all about. And then I read what Rando, who was a researcher, said. She said, um, death is not romantic. We read about he, he fought for his life and he died in a heroic way. She says it's not romantic. It's not graceful. It's not beautiful. In fact, it stinks, literally and figuratively. It is clammy too. It can sound bad and it often is ugly. Uh, what about loneliness? How does it come into play? I have seen people who uh, didn't want to come and visit my father to say goodbye because they didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to do. They themselves felt uncomfortable to be in the presence of death. I've seen some of his friends come and say, oh, don't worry. You're going to get up and everything is going to be okay. And I saw my father looking at them. He didn't say anything, but it was clear that he was thinking, I never knew that you're such an idiot. 
Uh, and I wanted to stop them. Mm -hmm. But by the time I could do anything, they have already blurted out uh, their words of wisdom. What, what, what happens to somebody who's dying? There are four basic family of needs that they, the dying people have. And I'll go through that uh, quickly. One is, first of all, the physical and the medical needs. We need to, if we can't heal them, at least do some palliative caring. Make sure that the ones who are dying die in a comfortable environment and hospices provide that uh, with people that they love and they get treated for whatever disturbs them. Not with the, with the hope of cure, but with the hope of making it more bearable for them. The second thing are social needs. People need to uh, continue and have some connection with people. And hopefully, they're not alone as they start their last leg in this life. Sometimes, they also need to finish unfinished business. I have been in war with this one. I've heard this one. I haven't spoken a long time with this one. There are all those things that need to be uh, addressed before we close our eyes. Then there are the emotional and psychological needs. I need to find out who am I. I review my life. I feel that there is a need in me to make peace with certain parts in me and with other people. And those are things that we probably all of us may want to do before we close our eyes. And the last thing is spiritual and religious needs. Some people come back in touch with their faith. Some people uh, start to pray and ask God for some deals. Not necessarily of being cured, but of don't let me suffer much or show me how to control what's happening to me so I can calm down. <clears throat> the overwhelming feeling that the dying have is of disconnection. They are leaving all those whom they know behind. And that's difficult. And we have um, more and more literature on near-death experience. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, people who died clinically and then came back to tell what they went through. And it's encouraging. But still, we don't know how is the world beyond and who we're going to find there. And if we weren't good kids, what's going to happen to us? We'll have to pay for our bad deeds. Uh, there are physical limitations. And sometimes, especially with cancer, there, there could be all kinds of physical um, abnormalities, growths, um, complications of surgeries, which can leave horrible uh, signs on us. That could prevent those people from from social connection, which is exactly what they need. That's exactly what they need. Loneliness is an inextricable part of dying. We as friends and sons and daughters and, and um, husbands and wives can ease that. But there is loneliness in death. Because we can be there, but the only one who is going is the one who's dying. And I cannot take his place for him. I can just be there. Do you remember um, uh, Tuesday, how is that Tuesday of Maury's or Maury's Tuesdays? Hey, you guys don't get films here? American films? Tuesday with Maury. Whoa, man. 
I'll give you a whole list of things you need to read and watch. Um, it's, it's about uh, a university professor who was dying of ALS, which is a horrible illness, and his student, who was his student 10, 15 years ago, suddenly heard about it and decided to come and visit him. And because of that one visit, he would come every week and he would sit with him and he would hear from him about life and about how it is to die. And uh, one of the things that he said to him is that uh, when people are with me, it eases a bit the loneliness, but it's still there. I'm the one who's going. And I'm the one who is leaving all of you wonderful people behind. Uh, two words about um, our studies on, on loneliness and dying. When the dying were compared to the general population, to see if there are any differences, uh, we found that in two, uh, growth and discovery and self-alienation, which was felt more acutely by the dying. And it's encouraging that growth was reported by people who were dying. I am growing from that experience. I'm not just dying like a dog. Something is happening to my soul. And that was wonderful to read. But there was also self-alienation, which is the distancing from myself so I can control the pain and the fear. If I may, um, very quickly, I want to go through what do I do with people who are lonely? How do I attempt to help them? Not to eliminate loneliness, that's impossible, but to do something about it. You may or may have not heard of Zeligman and his learned helplessness. Any, anyone is familiar with that? Okay. Um, learned helplessness is when we are in a situation where we try the door and the door is locked. And we stand there, not realizing that there is no wall here, so we can simply walk out from there. We're simply frozen in a situation that has solutions, and we don't know what to do about them. And that comes from a certain way of being, having been raised. Uh, if you're familiar with the book Sybil, about uh, a girl who was raised by a schizophrenic mother and was tortured every day of her childhood, and developed multiple personalities, this is a prime example of learned helplessness. We become, we learn how to be helpless. Uh, it's almost like hitting your head on the wall. And one of the first things that I, I do with people who are lonely, I say, let's look at that. Let's look if that was developed with you. And if that's really the case, then it's encouraging because I will show you how you can get rid of it and then find ways of how to deal with your loneliness. Uh, that's the same dog that was said before. Now he's behind bars. Uh, do you remember the story about the elephant and the twig? The, the, the little elephant was owned by an Indian guy. And he was young, and he didn't want him to run around. He tied him to a twig. And the elephant didn't like it and tried to get out of there, and he couldn't. <coughs> and then every day for the next year, the elephant tried to free himself. And then he realized, I can't go anywhere. The Indian boss wants me to stay here. He's going to feed me. He's going to give me water. I'll stay here. And then, 10 years later, people would see a huge elephant who could move a mountain being tied by that little twig. That's learned helplessness. We just get stuck. So we need to do something about that. Um, another example that I use when I talk about learned helplessness is the story about the two mice. There are more here, but the two mice who fell into a bucket of milk. And they look at each other, and one of them says, well, you know, mice cannot swim. So he just gave up and uh, drowned. The other one 
was the son of a gun. He wasn't going to give up. And he hit and hit and hit and hit the milk until he made butter of it and then climbed and went out. It was safe. So that's an example of what getting rid of learned helplessness can do. Uh, people talk about, I'm lonely, and here, I tried this, it didn't work. I tried this, it didn't work. My kids may not really love me, and my friends, yesterday morning, he came out, he didn't even say good morning to me. That means nobody likes me. And I tell a story about the angels, in two minutes, about the angels that demonstrates that not everything that, uh, not everything is the way it appears. There were two angels that came down to earth uh, to see how people live. One of them was old and experienced. The other one was a young angel who just got his wings screwed on. And as they are walking in, in the fields, they see a big house, like a big, rich house. And they knock on the door and they say, look, we have nowhere to stay. We are hungry. Please help us. And the guy says, okay, come in. And he gives them some crumbs of food. And then he throws them to sleep in the barn. And in the middle of the night, the young angel wakes up. And he sees that the older angel fixes the, it wasn't the barn. It was the basement. Fixes the wall of the basement. And he couldn't understand after being treated that way. They continued to walk the next day, and they found a very poor farmer who had one cow and two chicken. And they said the same thing, please help us. And the farmer says, sure, and come in. And they gave them a huge dinner, and then they said, you're going up to our bedroom. We're going to sleep in the barn. And that's what happens. The following morning, they wake up and the young one looks out the window and he sees the wife of the poor farmer sitting and crying and a dead cow beside her. And as they continue walking, he says to the old, experienced, wise uh, angel, how could you let it happen? The other one treated us so badly, you fixed his wall. This one was so amazingly kind to us, and you let the angel of death take his only cow. And he said, look, not everything is the way it appears. The first guy, who was really a son of a gun, when I was lying down in the basement, I looked in the wall, and I saw gold there. And I thought, well, he shouldn't have that gold. So I fixed the wall to hide the gold. At the farmer's place, in the middle of the night, I woke up to see the angel of death coming for his wife. I gave him the cow instead. Not everything is the way it appears. Okay, uh, I don't have time anymore. This is, these are the approaches that I found in my studies and research on how to address and cope with loneliness. But I can't do that to Nora. She, she wants to talk. So thank you very much.